Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 356 for November 17 of 2016. Echo Sport goes online in LA. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. want to welcome everybody to AutoLine After Hours. Very special edition that we got here, Mr. Gary Vasilash. Yeah, now we've gone Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> so tell everybody where we are. We're in Hollywood. We are literally in Hollywood. Hollywood High is, is right behind us here, and uh, the El Capitan Theater is, is right next door. And yeah, we're in the heart of, uh, heart of Tinseltown. And the reason we're doing that, of course, is the LA Auto Show is going on this week. We're at a special event that Ford's putting on. So you'll hear this thumping music in the background all throughout the show because they got all kinds of people in that they're entertaining. But they're also showing off a new vehicle here and that's why we've got Eric Leffler sitting in between the two of us. And Eric, you're the chief engineer of the new Ford Echo Sport. Yeah, I'm the chief program engineer of the new Echo Sport and happy to be here with you. That's great. Now, uh, just so our audience knows, this isn't the first thing that you've ever worked on at Ford. No, I've got about 28 years with Ford, of which I've spent most of the time on SUVs, and I've actually been a chief engineer of SUVs for the last 16 years. That included the Navigator, included the Edge, a couple generations of Escape, and now the new Echo Sport. And now the Echo Sport, and, and we should let everybody know, too, because I think there's going to be confusion over the pronunciation, because you have your EcoBoost engine but your Echo Sport SUV here. So you guys are gonna to continue to call it Echo Sport like you do in the rest of the world. Absolutely, and that goes back to the heritage of the Echo Sport. The heritage was it was first initiated back in 2003 in South America, and it was named the Echo Sport. The EcoBoost engine basically came along several years later, and it plays to the fact that we have a fuel efficient, economical engine, so EcoBoost. Yeah. And, it, and, and this new vehicle that you have does have an EcoBoost engine available. It sure does. It's got a one liter EcoBoost, which is an award winning engine. It's won the International Engine of the Year three years running, and we believe it's just a perfect combination of a power power so, train. So this for is this, this is the one that's uh, you can almost hold in your hand. It's a very small but very efficient, good performance output of the engine, and it drives this vehicle just beautifully. So, so you mentioned this has been around since 2003. This will be the third generation of the vehicle. So it'd be 2003, what 2008. Uh, 2013 is when it did had a major okay. freshening. 2013. And at that point in time, it expanded from the product offering in South America to other markets, including uh, Asia and, and, and Europe. Uh -huh. And now we're bringing the product here to North America with another uh, significant improvement in the product. So, you know, to my eye, it, it, looks, it looks a lot like an Escape. Was, was that deliberate? Well, it's part of the Ford SUV family. And as you've noticed, we have some brand and some family resemblance in all our SUVs. It starts with the grill and the front end of the vehicle. It's a very Ford traditional looking grill and it belongs right in the showroom alongside the other SUVs we have there today. Eric, let's back up a little bit. So I know a lot of our viewers are very familiar with the Echo Sport. They've seen them all over the world. But for those who have not, Gary just mentioned, looks like an Escape, but let's make a comparison size wise and the like of the Escape to the new Echo Sport. Okay, so this vehicle fits in the in the Ford SUV family. It's the smallest one underneath the Escape. It's about nine inches shorter than the current Escape. And overall dimensions and package are slightly smaller than it. But the neat thing about the product is that we've taken all of my learnings of experience as an SUV engineer over the years and able to, to be very innovative in terms of how we use the space to provide all of the features, the technologies, and the package capabilities through use of, of 
small nooks and crannies, features, and so on that we've innovatively provided to give the SUV customer everything they want to be able to take along all of the things that they usually take along in their SUVs. And front wheel drive, all wheel drive, what do you got here? Well, here we have two powertrains offered. With the front wheel drive, we have the one liter EcoBoost. And that's basically a, a very good engine for the, two, the front wheel drive. But we also, also offer an intelligent four wheel drive system. That's paired with a two liter GDI gas direct injected engine. And that is slightly larger in displacement and horsepower that's matched with the four wheel drive system that is an intelligent four wheel drive system. And you were telling me earlier, six speed automatic transmission. Both engines are paired with, with two different conventional oh. six speed transmissions. The two liter is, is paired with a transmission that is currently used in the Escape, and there's a slightly scaled down version of it for the one liter. So, as, as a small SUV, you, you've raised the ride height compared to a small car, correct? This, this vehicle meets all of the requirements in the all wheel drive version to, to meet the truck standard by normal US standards for ground clearance. Uh -huh. And so, when you take that intelligent four wheel drive capability with the ground clearance, it provides a really nice small SUV package that is very uh, capable in terms of meeting the SUV requirements of, of uh, any kind of road conditions. And that intelligent system you took from the Escape or, or modified from the Escape? Yes, it's very similar to the Escape and it uses wheel speed sensors, yaw rate sensors, and so on to basically. Uh, acknowledge or sense the, the, the vehicle or the road conditions and basically then manages the torque mm -hmm. of the uh, drive system so that it gives the customer the optimum tractive capability on road. Now one of the things I found that was interesting, John, and, and you will understand this far better than I do, this vehicle was originally developed in South America and, and Eric, t tell us what the reasoning is for South America. Well, back in 2003, when the vehicle was conceived in South America, as you know, South America is a large country like North America, and it also has challenges maintaining the infrastructure of the road system. So the road system there really requires a vehicle that is very capable, and so an SUV is a natural product that customers in South America would want to have versus a, a passenger car. That's the origin of this product, and it's evolved over the years. It's very popular all around the world. In fact, we sell it in 140 countries. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when you took this current generation to Europe, it didn't do all that well. There were things that, uh, as I remember, having the spare tire mounted on the, the rear door was something that customers didn't like. What, what are you taking from what you learned in Europe? What are you doing to make sure that this is going to be successful in the U.S. market? You're absolutely correct. When we no, when we introduced the product into Europe, we found some, some opportunities in the vehicle, which we've since corrected both in the current product. But we've leveraged that knowledge and what we saw in the acceptance of the customer as we remodeled the whole product and, and put the enhancements we have in this generation. That want in terms of refinement feature, removal of the rear tire off the back to make it more sporty on-road looking, as well as very capable in the, any road conditions, that's now provided and it will meet both the, the European customer expectation and obviously the North America customer expectation where we've tailored the ride and the handling and the, the entire vehicle feature offering to the North American customer. Mm -hmm. So this vehicle is, is truly a global vehicle. It's being built in six plants around the world. That, that's correct. We build a product in, in six plants around the world and we serve 140 countries with it. And basically, uh, it is right now the best-selling uh, SUV in the segment globally. Yeah, that was interesting. So, so outside the United States, there's no SUV that outsells this. In total for global volume, right, yes. Right. By, by market, there may be, but in total volume, right. we are the best-selling SUV with so this in the class. Six plants is a lot of plants. Yes, there's a, a lot of SUVs, I think. Oh, so how many globally, what do you guys sell of this a year? Uh, right now, we're in the in the neighborhood of uh, around 300, 350,000 units of. So it. some of the plants are very low production. Then. Lower volume production, yes. Yeah. What what are the six plants? I'm just curious. I wasn't aware of this. Uh, we have plants in in South America in Kamasari. Yeah. We have a, a plant in Chongqing, China. Uh huh. We have a plant in Chennai, India. Uh, we have a plant that's going to be in in Romania, and we also have a plant in Russia and we have a CKD facility in Venezuela. Unbelievable. Well, the Venezuelan one, I'm sure, is not making any of these right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Just because of what's going on. So, for the U.S. market, we're, which one of those plants will build it for the U.S.? This product is, is going to be, be built in the uh, Chennai, India plant and will be imported into the United States. Gotcha. So, so from an engineering perspective, how similar is a car that might be purchased in South America versus Europe versus the United States? 
Well, that's an interesting question because in some ways it's very similar. We get the efficiencies of scale, but we need to be sure that we're meeting the customer expectations and there are differences between markets. So what we've learned to do here at Ford is we, we tailor the product specifications to specific market requirements where we have the specific need to, to, to tailor to unique customer requirements, but where we can maintain the commonality, the scale, the efficiency of both engineering and manufacturing, then we are able to do that with the core elements of the vehicle. So basically, you start out with a, a highly common environment, you tailor it to specific markets. So, you know, one of the vehicles you worked on was the Navigator, giant vehicle. And here we have, what, a B segment vehicle back here? Correct, it's a B, considered B segment. So, so what learnings could you possibly bring from a Navigator to this, this smaller, tiny vehicle? Well, fundamentally, what a customer wants in an SUV is the same. They want to be able to go places, get there safely, right? They want to be able to do it in inclement weather. They want to be able to take things with them. They want technology to be connected and have all of the feature capability that the creature comforts in, in an SUV. And what we've been able to do is, is take the essence of all of that and basically scale it and using innovative design techniques and, and features, we've been able to package all of that in a much smaller environment. Mm -hmm. And that fits with what we're really looking for in this is to be able to go, to, to, uh, go small but live big. Right. What else have you done to tune it for the U.S. market? I'm thinking, you know, suspension, noise, abatement, and all that sort of thing. Well, it starts with all of the, uh, the normal safety requirements for the FMVSS, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, and all of the high uh, quality standards that we have and safety standards at Ford Motor Company, right? So that's, that's a little bit different between some of the markets of the EC requirements in Europe and North America. The vehicle is fully compliant with all of those. Uh -huh. Then we look at how the customer perceives the vehicle in terms of ride handling, steering response, all of the suspension tuning and so on, and it's uniquely developed for the customer's likes and taste in North America, which is slightly different than Europe and slightly different than So what, what, what would some of those differences be? You know, what would we pick up on? We like them softer, more compliant in the U.S., or well, what would those differences in, be? In Europe, basically, they like a tighter suspension, a little bit uh, a tighter steering, right? And we still provide in North America, we provide a little more uh, plusher ride, but, but very crisp in terms of handling and, and very nimble on the road. So it's subtleties in terms of, of how we tune within a, a DNA band for steering, braking, handling, and all of that. We have the band and then within the regions, we tune within the bands uh -huh. to be sure that we're bringing the Ford DNA to the product, but we're also then tailoring to the specific taste within the, the, the DNA. Uh -huh. In the U.S. now, we've got this small overlap test. Was this vehicle designed in a way to be able to match that test or be able to make, meet that test? And you're, you're referring to SORB. What's SORB? I haven't heard that actually. SORB is the IHS safety standard. That's a, it's an offset impact test. Gotcha. And, yeah. and yes, the vehicle has been, been basically, to, in, we are ensuring that we perform good in all safety standards, both the standard ones and the uh, third party uh, environment uh, little tests. Was that something that you had to really go back and re-engineer for the U.S. market? It's it's an area where we did have to go back and continue to refine the, the vehicle structure to be sure that it performed uh, for the, the market requirements and the safety standards within each, each market. Well, one of the things that you undoubtedly did for the U.S. market was put a lot of connectivity and, and entertainment capability in this vehicle. So you have CarPlay, Android Auto, Sync 3. Tell us, tell us about the, uh, the whole connectivity thing. Okay. So the, the, the people we appeal to, our customers, are both millennials and entry-level buyers as well as some more um, later in life customers that are empty nesters and, and are looking for an efficient package. That's a very kind way of putting it. Later in life people. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, all of the customers really like the ability to, to be stay connected, right? So we have the applied the Sync Gen 3, which is the latest Sync uh, generation that we have, which actually improves the voice recognition, so you have more of a conversational ability with the voice recognition in the vehicle, but it also adds all this connectivity, so Apple uh, uh, CarPlay. CarPlay and then uh, the uh, same thing with Auto. Android Auto will yep. be there, so all of your apps are now usable within the automotive uh, inside the vehicle environment. And it has uh, dozens of other features that you'll be able to, to explore through a very large uh, floating 8-inch display on the high series. And basically, it's a very reachable display from the driver-passenger side, 
most occupants can reach it without having their elbow even straight. It's that mm -hmm. close. And, and then the, the screen commands on the screen are all very intuitive so that you can drill down and access all of the feature capability of the vehicle. And then you have three sizes, so it's sort of like large, the series, medium, and small? Correct. Within the series offering, we offer a four inch display on the low series, a six inch on the mid, and an eight inch on the highest series. But they're all floating displays which are very architecturally designed mm -hmm. and feature that easy to access reach zone. So, so Eric, you, you've, with the engineering being done in, in South America, with work being done in India, with work being done in Dearborn, you must spend a lot of time flying on airplanes. Well, we have a very good ability nowadays at Ford Motor Company to stay electronically connected, right? So we have great tools to allow us to engineer in multiple locations and take full advantage of the clock. Mm -hmm. Once you get into the point where you're into launching the vehicle and you have then basically unique challenges in the individual manufacturing supply bases and so on, yes, it does require a little bit of travel from time to time. He, he, he was telling me about this, this trip that he just took and I, I, I don't know how he... Uh, oh. Couldn't get me to do it, let me just tell you that. <laughs> a lot of travel, eh? Yeah. Well, we want to ensure that we have the highest level of qualities coming out of any plant anywhere in the world, and we, gener we use the general standards that we have evenly across all those plants. So it, it helps to sometimes be there, see the product live, and be able to ensure that we're putting out the quality product in any place, any location that we build a product worldwide. Gotcha. Well, look, it's been interesting learning about this. We're going to take a quick break right now. We have Chantelle coming in to tell us how they're going to sell this thing. But Eric, thanks so much for giving us a little bit of a snapshot of what the new Echo Sport's all about. Well, thank you. Real good. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break right now. We give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. We're back in Hollywood, California at the big Ford party with the music still thumping in the background. But right now we've got Chantelle Leonard joining us. She's the executive director of marketing for Ford in the U.S. Welcome to After Hours. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. So you got to solve this this Echo Sport behind us here. How are you going to do that? Because it's the hottest segment in the industry right now, as you well know. I mean, it almost would be the easiest thing in the world to try to sell, right? But right. you got a lot of competition. Right. Yes, this makes it look like my job is going to be easy, doesn't it? What a great product. Uh, yeah, the segment is, uh, this is a great opportunity in terms of timing of when we're coming to market. A couple things are going on. One, the demographics. Uh, we're seeing two customer groups that are really interested in this kind of product. One, millennials, the younger audience, as they're starting to buy their first vehicles, and they're looking for a vehicle that's just the right size. Not too much, has all the capability features they need, still affordable, very much interested in technology. So they're a big group moving into this segment. But we also see at the other end, the empty nesters who are moving down. So don't need all the space that they used to have in an SUV, but they still want the capability and some of the features as well as the easy ingress, e egress. Um, so this segment, as you said, is growing rapidly. And this product is gonna be a huge opportunity for us. So Chantel, you're using the theme, go small, live big for this vehicle. I mean, is, is that gonna be carried forward? Yeah, go small, live big really is kind of the mantra of these buyers because what we see them doing is they're really more interested in spending their time and their money on experiences with their friends or family rather than acquiring stuff. Mm -hmm. And even some of those empty nesters are getting rid of that stuff so that you can really focus on what's important. So we think that's a great way to capture that mindset right. and really what this vehicle brings to life. Mm -hmm. This, the vehicle, though, is not going to be on sale for another year yet. I mean, I've got to believe you wish you had it right now. <laughs> well, it is really a great, um, great segment to be entering. So a year from now, we see even more growth. We've seen tremendous growth in this segment over the last five years. It's quadrupled. By 2020, we think it's going to double again. But a big portion of that is going to be driven by the Echo Sport. No kidding. But what do you do with cars like the Fiesta and the Focus, because I gotta believe that the success of this car is gonna come out of their hide. Well, um, it's interesting. The buyers that you see moving into this segment tend to come from a little bit bigger, either SUVs downsizing, or we see them coming from CD cars, uh, a big portion of them. So the Fiesta Focus, we think, still have a big opportunity in the segments they plan. So they would come from Fusion, more of the buyers? Potentially from that segment. Really? Yeah, we see that as they uh, need more flexibility in their lives. Uh -huh. But we also see that CD segment having a strong core buyer, too. Those who say, I like the professional image that a car presents for me, and I might want my cargo covered. Don't necessarily want the hatchback or the image of, a, of an SUV. That's Very interesting. distinct. I, yeah, I mentioned Fiesta and Focus, because that's where I thought the buyers 
buyers would come from. I, I would have thought that fusion buyers would go into an escape. Yeah, so we see that focus a bit, fusion, and then from those SUV buyers moving down as well. So you guys have a, a rather wide portfolio now from small all the way to expedition, yeah. very large. So, I mean, you mentioned that you see empty nesters and younger people being interested in this vehicle. I mean, so with each of these other SUVs, do you have psychographic or chronological uh, right. audiences for those vehicles? Yeah, we think we really have the perfect lineup of SUVs because it really does span a wide range of psychological um, or uh, demographic and psychographic needs. The one thing that we see that is across all of our vehicles is that feeling that their SUV makes them unstoppable. That feeling of confidence that their SUVs provide and it can be in the functionality of, I need to go off-road, that makes me unstoppable, but it's also um, an internal confidence that they get by driving these vehicles. So that can start from a small vehicle all the way up to the large vehicles. We see also the millennial group in particular as they start to reach that family stage, moving into some of those larger SUVs. So we really will have an SUV to meet all needs. Mm -hmm. And, and these look more like, I mean, so, so your competitors include the Encore and the Trax and the uh, CX-3. Um, which look more car-like, and, and this looks to me more SUV-like, so presumably that's a, a deliberate approach that you guys are Absolutely. taking. Absolutely. Again, carrying on that SUV lineage of Ford SUVs making you feel unstoppable, the styling um, in particular was designed to give you that more aggressive stance, um, that feeling of confidence, as well as the capability, the four-wheel drive, as well as uh, our connectivity, all of that delivering that SUV heritage. How do you break out of the clutter? Because everyone, as Gary was just na uh, naming some of them, everyone's into the segment right now. How, can you position this differently from the others or how? Well, I think we have a couple advantages. First is the Ford SUV heritage. We've been the number one seller over the past 25 years of SUVs, 12 and a half million Ford SUVs that we've sold. So I think our engineers, and they understand this customer and we know what the customer wants from the product. So I think that really helps coming into the segment. The other piece is we do have a lot packed into this little package, whether it's from the technology with best in class screen sizes and connectivity with Sync Connect. Um, there's lots of technology, but also even little things like 30 different stowage hooks, um, bins, compartments that packs in every little inch is used in a really effective way. So. Do you run into a danger where, whereby you may find yourself cannibalizing yourself? I mean, that somebody's going to go into a dealership and say, well, I was going to buy an Escape, but damn, that, that Echo Sport really looks nice. <laughs> well, we think we have a huge opportunity to bring new customers into Ford, to continue to add customers to our, our Ford owner, owner base. So, you know, you were, men you were mentioning the, uh, the Sync 3 and, and it has CarPlay and mm -hmm. Android Auto. Mm -hmm. um, from a marketing perspective, how important is it for Ford to be able to offer things like that to its customers? Well, we think it's really important, um, particularly as we're looking at this younger audience, but even the older generations who are now used to being connected all the time. They've also become used to the way that they use their phone and their connected devices, so they may be more comfortable using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Um, so we want to make it uh, available to them, mm -hmm. as well as having our sync system so that they can actually choose how they want to interact with the vehicle and what's most comfortable to them. Now, this, this comes, it, you have a titanium trim, which I guess has now become the signature uh, top end for, uh, for Ford vehicles, and then, then it goes down from there, um, a laddering approach. So could you talk to us about some of the trim levels? Sure, so we start with our S as our entry model, and then our SE is a well-equipped, um, kind of our volume model. And then we also add an SES, which is a sportier version of the SE. It adds sportier appearance cues, also has paddle shifters, um, also has standard 8-inch touchscreen, um, really delivers more of that sporty appearance, but also on the high-tech side. And then we offer the titanium at the top end, and where we see that really appealing to is, again, some of those move-down customers who are used to having a lot of features and technology in their vehicles, but just need a little less space. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've got to wonder, I mean, so the one liter engine, is, is there another car in the U.S. market that has a one liter engine? I, I don't believe so. So, or does Mini? We, we actually offer the one liter engine in the, in the Focus, as well as Fiesta. There you go. So, so, I mean, how do people react to that? I mean, do they, do they come in and say, so this engine, um, it's an EcoBoost engine, and it has actually won the um, International Engine of the Year Award. 
uh, three years in a row. So it's really well regarded as an engine, and it does it packs a great punch yeah. for a little engine. Uh huh. So it's so it's not it, it, it's it's a benefit, not a deficit in Absolutely. terms of uh, yep of, of this vehicle. Carrying on that EcoBoost technology, it really is. We think uh -huh. it's going to be a great hit. You know, and I was also interested in. Um, so, so the positioning of the SES, sportier, and then the titanium upscale. So is it going to be the younger buyer that's going to go for the SES or the older buyer or a blend of both? I think there's, you're going to see some of both. I think you're going to see some of that younger audience who is looking for the bit more, um, bit more appearance, a bit more sporty, uh, sportiness. But you're also going to have some of that older customer too, who, you know, they still want to look good in their vehicle, and they still are young at heart, and they're in, like that sport appearance package. You know, one of the things that, that John and I have talked about on the show several times is is whether SUVs and crossovers are are going to make sedans sort of diminish in in the market. What what do you see? Well, it's interesting that we do see customers with very distinct needs. Those who are choosing SUVs talk about um, the visibility of sitting higher, the easier ingress, egress, the flexibility of the package in terms of cargo and people. But we also see people talking about their cars as they still love to drive cars. Uh, there's also this a difference in imagery, feeling a little more professional in their imagery of, with cars. Um, also, there can be some security concerns of a hatch or of a sport utility, um, the cargo space. So there are distinctive needs of those buyers. Mm -hmm. So, so you think that there will be sort of a uh, There's still a need for both. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I think these are going to become more popular, but that, that, that's just me. <laughs> she, she's doing the stats. I'm not. So uh, that's right. I'm, I'm sure she knows what, what's going on there. Well, you know, I, for one, want to really drive the thing. That's always, you know, the proof in the pudding is when you get to test drive it. And really experience it firsthand. Yeah. So I can't wait for that to happen. But Chantel, thanks so much for coming on Autoline After Hours, bringing us up to speed of how you're going to bring this vehicle to market. Thank you. Really thanks so much for having me. Real good. Okay, we're going to take a quick break right now. We'll be back right after this. From Shanghai to the Silicon Valley, the auto industry may make news around the globe, but there's only one spot to get your daily dose. Check out AutoLine Daily at AutoLine.tv, Monday through Friday at noon Eastern. We're back. Now we've been talking about the Ford Echo Sport with the Ford people. We're bringing in two of our colleagues, Carl Brower from Kelly Blue Book and Bob Gritzinger from Ward's Auto. Great to have the both of you guys here with yeah, us. Good to be here. We brought, we brought them in the party that's going on the, the outside. Party so, that, so, yeah. they, so when you hear that bass. They off of Hollywood. Yeah. 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 I know we were rubbing elbows with the important people, but I mean, sorry. And then we came in to rub elbows yeah, yeah. with more important people. <laughs> He's pretty sure we ran into Amy Schumer. Well, yeah. so only because she said elevator. it, only because she said it twice, I'm Amy Schumer. And I was like, I, I don't think it was. I think she was just pulling our leg. I don't know. <laughs> she Look like her. <laughs> Anything can happen out here in Hollywood. That's right. So did I tell you I'm Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about the car. <laughs> Jethro Tone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, Carl, so what do you think? You know, uh, uh, I think. Quick shot on what do you think of the Ford Echo Sport? Well, I think it lands in the heart of one of the hottest segments out right now. So uh, if there's a problem with the Echo Sport, it's like, where was it 12 or 18 months ago, you know? But. Uh, well, th that's a good point. I mean, here's Ford to understand trucks and SUVs as good or if not better than everyone else. And this has been a gaping hole in their lineup. What's taken so long? Toyota and Ford are two of the biggest companies on the uh, planet in terms of making cars. They've also made some of the most, you know, highest profits of any company off SUVs. Fiat has a vehicle in this category, and Ford doesn't have a vehicle in this category. So, you know, I, I'm glad it's here, right. but I, I, I wish it had well, been here a while. Well, Jeep is still killing it in this segment with the Patriot and the Compass, and those are what? Seem like they're 10 years old. Yeah. But they got the Renegade now. Right. Well, the, the Renegade, renegade is here, here, right? And, and a new Compass. And then we'll have the new Compass. Finally put a you know, stake in right. that last version. And that yeah. new Compass will come early next year to the market. This is a year out still. All right, so so presumably, I mean, Ford is, is selling pretty much as many escapes as they can build, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. so I'm Ford and I'm saying, well, gee whiz, I'm selling all these escapes. Why do I want to have a smaller vehicle? Because that's this segment this. just went up by 30% through October of this yeah. year. But Plus the other thing, if like you don't attack yourself, vehicles. that means everyone else is attacking you. You better attack They've yourself. They've given away a lot of sales to Honda, 
and uh, so HRV, Mazda, HRV and Renegade are the two yep. best-selling vehicles yep. in this category, and then Mazda and CX3. Uh, CX3s there, and then yep. the, the Kia and Hyundai uh, entrance, the, uh, Tucson, uh, all of that uh, stuff. It's below there. the Tucson, and yeah. it's terrible that I can't remember the name as I sit here. Okay, you know? so they should have had uh, it out already. Jim Trainer is right? going to kill me. To have it a year from now is they're they're losing. They're yeah. losing by right. waiting. I mean, I mean, it looks like though to answer your question that it's a great looking vehicle well, that's what, what they've yeah, done that's with the next thing yeah, about right. it is fabulous you know i think it'll really do well i mean the good thing is you can be too little or too late maybe it's a little late but it's not too little this 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 segment is voracious well chantel just said what it's going to double it's going to double right, by yeah. 2020 yeah. as yeah. fast as it's growing it's, it's the market voracious. Not, not the vehicle. Right. No, no, not this but vehicle. The segment, the segment, segment though. Right. Segment. Maybe one and a half million vehicles then by 2020. Right. Yeah. So. But you uh, guys like the car itself? Oh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, you know as, done some... as Seinfeld said, if you're if you're the latest to the party, you better at least be the best dressed. So uh, <laughs> this one looks really nice. To get us a Hollywood reference. <laughs> there uh, you yeah. go. There I mean, you go. All right. So, <laughs> so Renegade has the more robust look. This has a more robust look. Right. But Trax, Encore, 500X, they don't, right? I mean, they have that, They have the higher stance, pretty much to look like cars. The Renegade, Renegade looks like a, a real SUV. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I put yeah. the Renegade, Renegade okay. and this. Okay. And then right. you put the others. Yeah. The others in yeah, more of a cute. cute. So the Trax looks a little SUV-ish. Just a little, but it looks but more cute, But it's right? cutie. cutie. Right. I mean, the cute. 500X no, doesn't look squished. The yeah. tracks, the tracks on the Encore, both to me are not the Encore, handsomely printed. The Encore doesn't look like an SUV at all. Now, it looks fine though. People like it. It's selling yeah. like crazy. So it, I, I don't think that's necessarily a strike against you in this category. Remember, these vehicles are replacing small cars for people. Right. So all you need is a little bit of elevated height, a little bit yep. of SUV, yep. and you're doing better than most of the people coming out of whatever they're coming out of. Or, right. or they're replacing larger crossovers. Right. Like a traverse and coming down. Right. And and, and they, they talked about they don't that. Need it or they like the they, parking. They, they've that talked about how the bit, uh, the um, uh, ba you know these empty nester baby boomers are moving down out of larger SUVs, larger crossovers, and probably big sedans, which are midsize well, are all going away. Well, and that's what's fascinating about these seg this segment and the one uh, the compact segment above it. People ask me all the time, it's like, so why are these selling so well? Well, who do they appeal to? And I always feel like I want to say, okay, you tell me who they don't appeal to, right, okay? Yeah. Because college student, young family, uh, retirees, I mean, there's almost every demographic that when you look at the sweet zone these things land in, whether it's fuel efficiency, price, flexibility, size, easy to, ease to park, they, they cover so many things pretty well. They don't really nail anything, but they kind of cover like seven different great categories that right. people care about. You know, if you're uh, wealthy and you want a big fancy car, or if you're a guy who wants a, a really powerful sports car, these aren't so good. No. Everyone else kind of kind of covered. So, so, I mean, so why would someone buy this rather than buying an Escape? Because It'll save money. it's save less money. expensive, yeah. it gets a little better mileage, and it's easier to park. If they're urban yep. dwellers, that's it's. But otherwise, it has everything else. You don't give up Sync 3, you don't give up all wheel but, but drive. Here's the thing. Yeah, you come down a class, and now you buy the fully loaded one. So right. maybe you can't afford a fully loaded Escape, you can afford a fully loaded Echo Sport. Exactly. Right. So there you go. And Next question. Well, but okay, <laughs> okay, okay, but, okay, but, okay, but, but that goes to your, and that goes to your profitability thing. If they're selling Escapes, but they're having to use a certain amount of incentives or whatever, and they're going out the door at one price point this is going at a lower price point but that price point it's a loaded one making right. up a larger profit for right, right. these could actually be more profitable than the escape well, even it, though they it, cost it less seems like everybody's selling these things with you know very little incentives you could really speak to that right uh, right we have finally noticed in the last six months a little bit of an uptick you know like jeep you know as we know fell for like the second or third month yeah, in a yeah. row the incentives that only used to be on cars are now kind of like you know starting to infect the suv world but that's that has nothing to do with the cars that has to do with the cycle we're in where we finally plateaued and right. some of the manufacturers are like okay we plateaued i'm okay and others are like numbers have to keep going up keep pushing these cars out what's it take fleet incentive yeah. make them grow got to have that number grow so i i gotta wonder for most americans who are generally large americans by and large i mean sadly it, yes okay sadly, so yes. We're not all Californians. So, <laughs> so, so, how small is too small? I mean, to get, to get back to the point of, of looking at the Escape versus this. Now, you guys said, oh, it's going to be cheaper, you can get more stuff, on yeah. and on and on, right? right? But at the same time, 
interior volume is probably smaller in this than it is in this case. Sure it is. So people people want their room and the people, you know, they still have their stuff. And well, they it want depends how many people are going to be using the vehicle. If it's yeah. two people in the vehicle, this thing's got all the room in the room. world. Right. You want to put four full-sized adults, you're not buying this car. Yeah, it's no. not a good but, car for that. But the rear seat room, if you guys climb in, did you, you were here for one of the backgrounders yes. and climbed in. There's good space there. You could easily carry four people now. And you check know, the knee room. I, I, I suggest like you go was, back and check the knee room, right? Well, but it, I hate look, and I'm not putting this vehicle down. You get a small vehicle, you're just not going to have that yeah, yeah. much room. What I want to ask you guys is, what do you think about a one-liter EcoBoost? You know, because when the they launched cylinder. that in this country, it was only in the Fiesta, only with a manual. Yeah. So, is it going to make it in a bigger vehicle with SUV an with an automatic? I think it will. I mean, I think. What they've gotten out of that one liter, as we all know, has been pretty amazing. You drove, yeah. you drove that Fiesta with a manual shift and it was like, there's no way this has only got one liter and three right. cylinders right. in it. Totally. This will be adding to its uh, you know, load that it's got to move around, but it'll also have a couple more years of development. I bet they'll be able to maybe squeeze a little more power out of Good it. Good point. So more torque. That's true. More and, time. And I think to... the other thing is, is that most people who are going to be buying this vehicle are going to be thrifty. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, but that, everybody not wants to be thrifty, but when that, you know, big semi is bearing down on right. you, you want to mash the pedal and get out of there and not sound like the engine's going to hand grenade. Well, and you, and you wonder if the fuel economy will suffer similar to uh, EcoBoost and an F-150 with a load. Right. You know, we all know that the number is this, but right. people put any kind of load on it or drive it at freeway speed all the time. Yeah, it's it's you, it's always the same thing. It's like how far down does the pedal have to go to right. give you the level of acceleration and maintain the speeds you want to go. Yeah. If, if in a car with a bigger engine where it's here, that ends up my better mileage than a car with a nice tiny efficient engine that's here yeah. all the time. I've Would learned it, that right. one in the past. So, so and working so hard. Right. So yeah. So in other words, don't carry a lot of large Americans and bricks. Or buy the or by the two liter all wheel or the one and a half liter all wheel drive. If you're going to the bowling uh, night, see if you can check your check the uh, bowling balls and leave them in a you know somewhere safe at the thing. So you're just driving at the alley. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, yeah. you buy the one liter as a tender to your F-150. <laughs> it's the dinghy. Right. Yeah, it's the dinghy. <laughs> yeah, so so there what you do you guys go. think the most appealing feature is? I think the level of, of high-end uh, uh, technology that you can get. I think the fact that you can get really advanced technology on an otherwise small, inexpensive car. I mean, that's really the wave of the future for every car company. We're seeing that, you know. I mean, when you can get Honda Sensing on a 21,000 low, you know, base level Civic. If you just want to throw a thousand bucks on top of an LX Civic for 21 grand, you get radar cruise control and lane keeping assist and all, you know. And, and, that's great, and I think the fact that they're offering the same level of technology in, in a car like this, that's that's what makes younger buyers who this would primarily appeal to uh, want to. What do you oh, think, it's Bob? It's like, I mean, like the Focus, they loaded it, you know, they included a lot of those features, bring that technology down into less expensive vehicles, and, and you're right, you know, uh, offering... CarPlay, Apple, uh, uh, Android Auto, right out of the box. Yeah, you know, not everybody does that. Steel. And we, don't forget the beautiful thing about technology is once you get through the R&D process of developing it, the incremental cost of adding it to a car here, let's be honest, it's nothing. You right, know, you're right. able to charge consumer more, but the actual material cost of all those little circuit boards, it's very cheap. Yeah, and it's, you know, uh, people love that kind of stuff, but coolest feature with this vehicle, swing gate. In a heartbeat. So explain Being that. Able, swing gate. A what do you swing mean? gate. You open the. You don't open a lift gate upward. You open a swing gate out. Like a regular so it's, door. It's, it's like hinged a, the like, fifth a door. Door oh, like a door. Door is a regular door. I thought you were Sad. talking about some kind of a, uh, a uh, hipster gate. thing. Yeah, no, no. I thought you were talking about some kind of scandal in in uh, yeah. Washington oh, well, with, some, with some couples. That, never mind. Yeah, anyway, yeah, no, so yes, go ahead. Yes, there could be some swing gate going on. I can see where you would be. I am from Los Angeles now. They did call it a swing gate, and it's. <laughs> and and, it, and I, I just think that that's always a cool feature. I like it on the Honda Ridgeline that you can open yes. that uh, bed. Well, this is not a new idea. Remember the uh, 70s uh, uh, station wagons where you could well, you know, pull sure, the door absolutely. one way and it swung, and yes. the other day and it folded but this down? Is, that was this great. is strictly just hinged on the yeah, side. side. Right. But 
I think that that's a great thing in terms of being able to, you know, readily get at things in there. It, and, swing, you know. it swings on the correct side too, right? Wasn't it the uh, RAV4 where it was the Japanese market car? One of them had yeah, a oh, Japanese yeah, market yeah, car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it, forgot about that. The wrong yeah, so you had to walk well, around it. You had to stand in traffic to get stuff in and out of it? Yeah, Sportage had it as well. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, we got to take a quick break right here. We got a lot more to talk about, but we're going to be back in just a moment after we give a shout out to our good friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. And we're back somewhere in Hollywood, somewhere at some sort of Ford party. The music's about to get loud, but we're going to push on through it without a line after That's right. hours. Break on through to hey. the other side. There you go. They've got, they got their version of a party. We got our version That's of a party right, right yeah. here, baby. That's so what are you going to be looking at at uh, the LA Auto Show this week, Bob? Uh, I really want to see how people um, react to the Jeep Compass. The new Compass is the car they should have they should have been building for the past 10 years. Yes. Why? Why do you say that? Well, because the Liberty, they, they tried to make a cute, Jeep, smaller Jeep Grand Cherokee, and it was overbuilt, too heavy, uneconomical, uh, all the bad things. Yes. Uh, way, uh, you know, people liked it for its cutesy looks, little bug-eyed Jeep, but you know, all those all those negatives were If you dug into the engineering, you realized it's like, wow, this right. thing wasn't really well and, designed. And so then they, the, the response to that was Compass Patriot, which were not really good vehicles right, right out of the box from a powertrain, ride handling, noise vibration, all of that, not good. But, you know, they're still selling them. And, well, but if you uh, go back to Compass Patriot, but, I mean, Wolfgang Bernhardt was still in the company when they developed those two vehicles, and he right. said that they had... They had to have both, right? The car-like one and the jeep-like one. The jeep-like one, yes. Well, and and, the, and they wouldn't stake them because they just kept selling. You know, as right. these small SUVs came up, these really archaic SUVs that should have been knocked away a long time ago, they just kept selling them. I remember when they would right. hit like record months. When a, when the Compass would had like a record month, like a year and a half well, ago, and I'm like, it. wow, you right. know the market has gone nuts when the Compass is having record months. Yeah. But I think they've sold like 80, maybe 150,000 Jeep Patriots and Compasses through October and of this year. And think of the cost it's like amortization. A tenth of this this small CUV market. Yeah. Well, and think of the cost amortization. I mean, those yeah. things, all the tooling paid for itself. That's just pure profit. Oh, right. I would have yeah, kept selling them too. paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, the three-headed dog, basically. So, so uh, that, and then finally, now, I mean, of course, we haven't driven the thing. We have not a lot of, ton of information about it, but just seeing it, it's the right proportions. It looks right. I think it's going to be, you know, to use from another industry, a killer app. Yeah. Yeah. I so agree. that's one. Okay, so Carl, what are you going to be on the lookout for? Well, I, I think I'm breaking tradition here because we're all supposed to be talking about SUVs since they rule the world now. I think that new Audi R8, that exclusive, uh, was it exclusive or executive version, whatever, that limited production one, oh, yeah, yeah. that looks really cool. I mean, I love gray. There was an older color on a uh, Audi TT from 10 years ago called Aviator Gray, which I thought was one of the coolest colors. It was like a non-metallic middle medium gray color. And I don't think it's the same code, but it looks very similar to what this R8 is going to be painted. Uh, Plus all the other cool stuff they're doing with like laser headlights and all. So you live in LA now, so that's, uh, that's doing right. amazing. You know? stuff. It's all about if, you're, if, you know, if it's not a high tech toy, then I'm not supposed not to like it. All. So yeah, well, Audi has all that all that great instrument panel stuff going on that. Yeah. Is just phenomenal. Yeah. So, Virtual cockpit, so, Google you know, Maps. Another one is uh, the, this thing, we, uh, this uh, Jag, electrified Jag. That's pretty yeah, cool. Tell me about that because I haven't seen the, that. The, the I Pace. So we're talking about a 400 horse, uh, four second electric SU, uh, CUV. It's so one of these things. 220 but range in a 220 charge. 220 mile range. And it'll be out in um, late uh, second half of 2018. Yeah. 
So is this based on the F-Pace or is it a totally uh, different vehicle? I, it's a totally different vehicle because it's got the battery, it's a pure battery uh, car, it's yeah, pure it's electric. A, so it yeah. doesn't share a platform with any existing Jaguar. But what, battery what, floor, motors on the front and rear axles. And a but, great exterior design. Does yeah. that fit into, what's their new platform called? Ingenium or what do they call oh, that's that? The Ingenium. Ingenium. No, no, engine, no, that's engine. an engine based one. This is a oh, pure that's electric. that's the engine, yeah, what am I saying? But what, so is this a totally all different new, platform? All new, all new. How can they afford to do this? Tata, and, uh, baby. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tata. Yeah, I just still Callum make says, <laughs> yesterday. Ian Callum says that this thing is the basis for, you know, potentially yeah. a whole line. They'll have a whole of line of EVs electrified built vehicles. Off of wow. He's loving it because it just tore up the sketchbook. He can do whatever he whatever yeah. he wants. When you when you take away that drivetrain and you can not have an engine to deal with or even a transmission tunnel and all, you can do all sorts of crazy designs. And stuff. it has he loves it. It has the coolest uh air scoop thing in the hood like it brings the air in below and it has just a giant vent across the front of the hood you know rear facing so that the as an outlet and i asked him you know that's a little wild and crazy he said that's that'll be production yeah that's a functional yeah. thing and so, it, it's a neat car john you'll you'll no, like no, it I, I can appreciate it. I'll, I'll, i can't wait to see it but I'm just not convinced they can afford to do it. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, uh, Uncle, 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 Uncle Todd. Don't they have the T guy Todd, behind them? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're good. They got the T guy behind them. They're cool. As long as they don't no. drink tea after Brexit, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, you look at Jag, their growth is through the roof. They've launched like, I don't know how many successful products in a row in the last like 18, 24 months. They have, they are well funded and it's not just money, they're throwing money and excellent design and no, execution. No, no, I totally agree. And, and they're, they're turning a profit yep. too. And, and one more element to this electrified Jag, it's also the basis potentially for a Range Rover. Right. Electrified oh, Range Rover. Yeah. And now you're into, now you're, now you're in a, a hydro you know. boss. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Spread them. Okay, maybe now I buy into this program. They still should have made the CX-75 though. I'm still annoyed that. They, oh. they did say some elements of the CX-75. With micro turbines? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was yeah, really that cool. That was an awesome I, I concept totally car agree. that should have been made real. Although it was sort of real in the James Bond movie. Oh. Yeah. So what else out there? I don't know. You know, there's going to well, be a Lamborghini, Stelvio, right? From, right? Uh, Stelvio. Stelvio, the Alfa Romeo. I think that, I think that is the new, the new yep. Mazda CX-5. Yep, yeah, CX-5. Is, is it truly fun. all new? I, I think it is truly all new. I That's mean, been around for a while. No, it hasn't. Oh, I want to say for like five years. Well, okay, I but it's been around for five years. So shouldn't they just be doing a mid-cycle refresh yeah, on that right. part? That I mean, car's done really well for them. I yeah. think I right. think they want to. If it's if it's a refresh, it's going to be extensive because that car, by itself, that's been like the RX, you know, 300 or 350 of Mazda. You know, right. it has made the entire brand right. elevation. All right. So so when the current generation Mazda 6 came out, you and I drove together down in Texas, and one of the discussions we had was. How does Mazda do it? How does Mazda, which has smaller scale right. than any of the other guys, come out with vehicles that have performance, it has materials, it just has a level of, of, of quality and execution that is, is they're punching above their weight. I so, know, all are. these years later, how do they do it, Carl? Uh, they, this is a point of pride for them. I think yeah. you talk to Mazda people and they're, they're, it's almost a cult-like thing with the people who work in Mazda because of all these reasons. They know that they are doing things that probably no other car company would do in terms of what they're accomplishing given the resources and the personnel they've got to accomplish it. And I think they're just super efficient. They got a lot of passionate people working there and they're able to produce cars that nobody would think a car company of that size could produce in terms of amazing. And they're looking at great technology, you know, this new technology with their handling, you know, where they're actually making the car kind of like do its thing right before the turn. Yeah, predictive all wheel drive yeah, as yeah. well. And you making know, the, the ride quality, un, you know, really it's very subtle stuff that makes the cars ride and handle better than, again, you would ever think they could or should. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. What it is, is a laser focus on, you know, certain things that they want to hit. And right. it's drive quality, it's being sporty Fuel like that. efficiency with Sky efficiency. Okay, how come Subaru kicks their ass when it comes to sales? <laughs> well, because, you know, it's a Subaru. It's the beauty of all-wheel drive, oh. John. Yeah. Oh, now I understand. <laughs> yeah. The light has been revealed to me. The crazy oh, no, thing. I mean, what I'm pushing <laughs> back on you guys is I, 
I think Mazda's a cool little company. I yeah. think they do terrific little cars. They're their garage. Their sales suck, and I don't think they make much money. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I mean, if you were going to say what's kind of the most underappreciated or underrated or uh, right. uh, underknown yeah. company out there, That's given right. what they do right. versus what they sell, how much they sell, Mazda yeah. wins the, the prize. Other thing. I don't know anybody who hates Mazda. Everybody right. seems to have a good image of it. Right. Nobody buys the product. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I don't. I think their cars are better than Subarus. But everybody goes and buys Subarus instead. I don't get it. Subaru has uh, extremely good product, but what they've really got is marketing magic. I mean, they have come up with some well, of the and, best marketing they own, campaigns. own that small car, all-wheel drive. You yeah. know, all that history. Somebody back there made the decision to go all-wheel drive all the time. Right. And that's been a win for them. Now. And they, and they jumped on the crossover thing pretty early too, right? The Outback, right. you know. I mean, yeah. you know, back in the but Paul Hogan that, days and stuff, that was way ahead of the curve. On, on XB that. Crosstrek is one of these, right? Right. Yeah. So, and that's killing it. Yeah. But uh, I think Mazda realizes their limitations. They do focus. It seems like very specifically on being more, you know, the sportier company. The crazy thing for me thinking about Subaru and Mazda is they're, they're getting this done without pickup trucks. You know, know. and hell, Good even point. Mercedes is going to build a pickup truck. <laughs> so, I don't know if we'll ever see it in this market. I don't think, I don't know if they're going to oh, even try to compete yeah. here with that. Oh, they, they look, will. They look, I don't know, they I look think. at Nissan and Toyota and they're like, I don't know, do we want to step yeah. in that? And they're looking at the profit margins on those trucks and saying, we're missing a lot yeah. here. Oh yeah. So so if, if Mercedes came into this market, Carl, do you think that they could sell a pickup truck at all? I don't think so. No, I don't think on a scale that would make sense for them to go through the trouble to get here. And don't forget that unlike most other markets, Mercedes is seen as this pure high-end thing. I don't know if they want to be a pickup truck market. Hold on, because this this just this past weekend I was astonished at how many ads I saw on television for Mercedes vans. And I mean, oh, yeah. they they're doing really well with yeah. those. Like, there's no yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That whole... So I think they could easily slip a pickup into that lineup, not their past car lineup. Aren't they, didn't they even talk about it in terms of the commercial vehicle? You know, they fit it into that group yeah. in their global planning. And guess what? These commercial vans that they're marketing, they're marketing them as upscale right. commercial oh, vans. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's the Mercedes yeah. of cargo exactly vans. Exactly right. <laughs> and, and, you know, very and nice wooden floor. Clear, in it. Clearly, there's enough profit margin for them to ship vehicles all the way across the ocean with a bunch of seats in them, only to yank them out when they get here to avoid the chicken tax. So, course, so right. there must be enough yeah, yeah. profit margin yeah. for that. You know, it's interesting, the LA show is the automobility show now, Automobility yeah. LA. So, yeah, so, so being at Angelino, um, what's up with that? There, well, you know, Los Angeles. If, is this, this Carol's fault? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Possibly. I'll, I'll embrace this one as my fault. No, <laughs> if, if, if LA is anything, it's great at jumping on a trend, okay? And technology is the hottest trend going in uh, cars right now. The auto industry is being overrun with the technology, you know, buzz. So why would you have an LA auto show when not without badging it as it's not really an auto show? It's a technology showcase. Yes. It's <laughs> mobility. Hey, Ford's leading the way, right? Hey, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Speaking of these smart, guys, you, you know, know, they're they're having auto mobility, smart uh, Ford's having smart mobility. Everyone's everyone's mobile. That's yeah, not an auto, it's not an auto show anymore. It's a mobility show. No, listen, right. It's not remember, an auto company, it's a mobility. A decade company. ago, right. everybody was every auto show was bragging that they were the greenest auto show in yeah. the world. Right. And then about five years ago, every auto show was bragging they were the most electric car yeah. out. And now they don't care about that. It's well, all mobility. LA used to be nothing but green theme. You guys remember yeah. that? You came here, right. and it was almost like if you introduced a new car that had an internal combustion engine, you know, there was a oh, bit I, of this I, going I, on. I remember, that. I remember being outside in the parking lot, and there was a demonstration where people were converting a Prius to a plug-in and putting batteries in yeah, it yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And, and I remember asking them, so... How does this all get cooled and everything? And they said, yeah, well, that's not our problem. Details, you know, details. details, details. They'll, they'll, they'll be all work. 
but they, they were, were but they were cool. We let it get hot, even though that makes the planet hotter. But they were two or three years ahead of a Prius plug-in. Right. right. So and it was like crazy green. They'll take right. care of that in post production, just like the film <laughs> studio. Fix do. it in post, just that's like John right. has to do with us when we do these yeah. shots. Yeah, that's it. So now it's all about what? <laughs> call the Uber, call the Lyft, get autonomous, you know, uh, is that a zip car, you know, yeah. share your vehicle, is share that your resonate, bike. Is that gonna resonate with the public here? You know, it'll be interesting to see. We're inside baseball, so we're we're. It's so obvious to us that this used to be an auto show that's now turned into this auto show with a technology element grafted on. Honestly, I think most people they're like, let's go down into LA and have some fun. Oh, let's go see some cars. Oh, now there's like a bunch of you know uh, integrated circuits next to the cars. Let's it's go like, check yeah, those it's out like too. CES came to the auto show. Right. You know, right. which I suppose if you look at how huge CES has become, you might say... It's another auto show. Might as well. Yeah, yeah it you is know, another auto right. show now. Yeah. So, Hey, guys, we ought to wrap this up. I think the music's getting louder out there, and we're going to have to shout over it. Oh, it's you just want to dance. dance. Yeah, you yeah, I get you. Dance. <laughs> it's time to play electric music and boogie. There, yes. there you go. <laughs> so, Bob Gritzinger, Carl, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. all good. Very fun being on with you. And then always. Gary, let's do this again in the studio. Yeah, I think so. Where it's a little quieter. A little more controlled yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.